Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time on not the worst film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, that dubious honor would go to the 2010 remake, but a very close second, and that film is A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. And pretty much the only dreaming you will be making, the only dreams you will have after watching this movie, is hopefully dreams of a better movie than this. A movie that doesn't suck like the dream child does. This film I've never been a fan of. When I first saw it on VHS I thought it sucked, I thought it was boring, I thought it was a chore to sit through, I thought it just was a really really big step down from Nightmare 4 and I always thought it was the worst film in the Nightmare franchise until the remake came along. And it really surprised me because I'm like, wow, there's a, there's a Nightmare on Elm Street film out there that is actually worse than The Dream Child. I never thought that was going to happen. But it did. And I'll get to that later. That's saving the worst for last, so to speak. Um... And I saw it in the uncut version, too. I had saw it in the uncut VHS, which is, for some reason, the uncut version of the film is still not available on DVD or Blu-ray. Nope. Not available on DVD or Blu-ray, folks. If you want the uncut version, well, you know, you're going to have to keep buy the VHS or keep your VHS or buy the Laserdisc, because if you don't have either one, you're shit out of luck or find the scenes on the internet or something. I don't know why it's so hard to put those scenes back in the film. It doesn't really make the film better. The film is still very poorly paced. It still has a plot that just meanders around. And it's still a very muddled, confusing, disappointing film. But with the gore scenes put in, it at least makes the kills more watchable. And it makes some, more inter it makes the, it makes some of the kills more watchable anyway. Um, and it brings an edge to them that it, the film lacked. Because a lot of the edge, it was darker, but the kills felt really tame in comparison to part four, or comparison to part three, or part two, or for the first film. It just felt really tame to me, and that's because a lot of them were cut down by the MPAA. Especially the speed kill scene, where, where Dan's death scene, which is one of my favorite death scenes in the, it was my favorite death scene in the film, and one of my favorite kills in the franchise. I mean, so this film isn't completely without its merits, and I'll get into, you know, there are some things about it that don't suck, and I'll get into them soon enough, but in my opinion, the flaws definitely outweigh the positives that this, this movie has. Um, but, uh, anyway, gore, the, the gory scenes, I mean, there's a little bit of, it, it adds an edge to the kills that the film felt, the theatrical version was lacking. And it's not going to be an example, it's not going to be like, the My Bloody Valentine film from 1981, the original My Bloody Valentine, where it was already a good movie to begin with, but became a really great slasher when the kills were put back in. No, it's still, Nightmare 5 is still going to be a crappy movie and one of the worst sequels in the franchise, even with the gore put back into the film. But it would it would be nice to see it, though. It still would be nice to be able to see those kills. That's the thing. Well, it's still be nice to see it uncut. And for some reason, they're just not able to do that. Because I don't know why. I guess they don't think there's enough of demand for the uncut kills or Nightmare 5. Maybe there isn't. There's a movie it's not very warmly received by critics and fans. And for a lot of good reasons. Um, but I still think the fans, and I still think people who actually do like this movie, which I, I've, I've talked to some people who do like this film, and that's cool. I, I mean, that's great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad there are people out there to like this movie. I'm glad, but you know, I'm just, I'm definitely not one of them. But hey, it's cool. You know, uh, different opinions are what makes this world interesting. So it's nice to know that there are people out there who actually do appreciate and do like the Dream Child. I, I'm just not one of them. I, I am not. <laughs> I don't like this movie. Um, but yeah, get the kills back in. I mean, let's get them on DVD and Blu-ray already. What, what's the hold up with that? Um, but yeah, this is not 
it's not a film that really pisses me off. Like, it's bad, but it wasn't, like, the visit bad to me because it, it, it did have an interesting plot and it did have some things about it I didn't mind. It, it's, I would say it's not really a complete failure. And that's what's frustrating about it is that there were some elements of it that I thought were really interesting and really intriguing, but the film just didn't execute them very well. It just failed to execute the the plan uh, that it was trying to set up. And uh, yeah, and it's going to be an interesting video because I, it's, it's, I'm not really, really angry at this movie. It's not a movie that afterwards I was just like, oh, fuck, Nightmare 5. No, I honestly would say from this year, which is a terrible year for horror films, by the way, uh, I would say Halloween 5 and, and Friday 13th Part 8, I definitely, I definitely really, really dislike. Uh, those are films that I would probably say I, I don't like more than this. I mean, this sucks, but I'd say this is the least terrible out of, out of those three because for me personally, because this has some problems, but it doesn't have as many problems as those films do for me personally. Um, but that's just me. Um, but yeah. Um, anyway, let, let's get started, shall we? Um, the film is directed by Stephen Hopkins, who is a director that I, I'm partial to. I do like Stephen Hopkins. Uh, the first film was introduced that he did uh, was uh, Predator 2, and I love Predator 2. And that that's one positive that this film has in its favor. It Due to the fact that Stephen Hopkins is able to finish the film when, when he was given four weeks. He was given four weeks to shoot this movie. That's not a lot of time at all. He was given four weeks to shoot the film and a further four weeks to edit the movie. This meant that he had to shoot on one stage while the crew just dressed the other so they could shoot almost continually. And after he made it, the studio was so impressed that he was ended up giving the task. He was given the task of directing Predator 2. So, hey, if this lame boring, disappointing sequel, nightmare sequel, paved the way for Stephen Hopkins to step, you know, step into the shoes and to get in the director's chair for Predator 2. Great. That's one of the best things that this film <laughs> ever did is, is enable Stephen Hopkins to be able to do Predator 2 and show that, hey, you know, I, I, I do know what I'm doing and I can direct a really good movie. And he did that with Predator 2. Um, so, yeah, Stephen Hopkins, though, he sold this film. He sold his uh, directing on this movie by showing a lot of these storyboards and this art that he was working on that's very gothic and fused and, and, and a lot of gothic architecture. And he wanted to bring this uh, gothic element to the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. And this Robert Shea and the other producers thought that would be a good, 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 uh, nice spin or a new take on night on nightmare on the nightmare on elm street franchise i think that's a mistake though i i, I the the gothic aspects of this film is a perfect love-hate relationship for me i love the production design i love the cinematography the gothic cinematography i love the mc escher stuff near the end i i love the the map paintings of the asylum that looks straight out of a, out of you know out of the Middle Ages. I love it. I do. I really. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's it's a work of art. But I, at the same time, I hate it because it doesn't work with this franchise. It doesn't fit with Freddy. It doesn't fit with a Nightmare on Elm Street. It just sticks out like a sore thumb when you have the small town of Springwood and you have a giant fucking castle asylum that looks like it's straight out of Bram Stoker's Dracula that takes you out of the movie because you're like wait no that's not the asylum in Springwood give me a fucking break no 
That thing's like a fucking medieval castle. I mean, that's I have expect Dracula to be living in that thing. What 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 did uh Yvonne get transported to fucking Transylvania or some shit? It's cool, but it doesn't fit with the franchise. It doesn't fit with the film. It's it's an aspect that was never really shown in any of the other films in the franchise. Maybe a little bit kind of stuff in Nightmare 2, uh, but not really. Not to this extent. So when you have the flashback scenes of showing Freddy's birth, and when we had to cover Amanda Krueger again in her story, which that was another aspect of the plot I didn't really care to see again, but... When the scene is shot in a way where it's shot like it's a gothic inspired gothic scene, like it's straight out of a Ken Russell film, um, and the lighting and the way everything is shot and the way that the production design looks, this is supposed to be in the 40s, but the way that everything is shot, the way that the characters act, the way that the, the, the production design is, is set up, it looks like it's the 1800s or the early 1900s. And that that hurts the whole origin story you're going with because you go with this gothic aesthetic that doesn't work with what you're trying to do. It's, it's To me, it was like trying to shove a square peg into a round hole. And that's why I love and hate the gothic aspects of Nightmare 5. And one aspect, I love it, it's great, it's cool, it's really visually stunning, it's it's some really, it's nice to look at. And on another hand, it just, it sucks because it doesn't fit with the film. It just causes a serious disconnect with me, and it just, it feels fractured. It feels like it belongs in another film. And that's why I wish that this gothic look that Stephen Hopkins was going for, and he would have done in his own film. That wasn't a Nightmare on Elm Street film. That was, it could have dealt with nightmares or dreams or something, but it was his own creation. It was a completely different animal and instead of Freddy, instead of a Freddy film. And I really think that would have really helped the film in a lot of aspects, is that if it didn't try to be so serious and so trying to be like a gothic horror and it just doesn't work with Nightmare on Elm Street. You got Freddy going around saying these one-liners, it's a boy, you know, and then you got this gothic architecture and it's just, it doesn't blend. It doesn't mesh. It's, it's, it's not a good mix, but I commend Stephen Hopkins effort. I commend the production designers and their effort and their hard work. It just, I just wish it was done in, in not in a Nightmare on Elm Street film because it just doesn't work. Sadly, it just, it was, it was, hey, it was a nice attempt. It was interesting, but it just didn't work. It just didn't work for me. Um, so the film is not produced by uh, Rachel Talley this time. It's produced by her husband, Rupert Harvey, because she was really busy. She was like, she was, she went on the go. She wanted to produce Cry Baby with John Waters. And she didn't really, she was kind of burned out a nightmare, and I don't blame her. And it's based on a screenplay by Leslie Boehm, and based on a story by John Skip and Craig Spector. John, Kip, Scott, John Skip and, and Craig Spector, they originally wrote the first draft, and pretty much it was, it was completely rewritten by Leslie Boehm. There's pretty much not, not, I don't think there's really anything. There's maybe like one thing from their script that was, actually made it to the film, which is really too bad. I guess William Cotswinkle also might have helped with a rewrite somewhere. Maybe it was uncredited. Same thing goes with Brian Hedgeland. Um The film features a decent score by Jay Ferguson. So once again you got, you know, hey, a decent score, okay. You know, I Alright, Jay Ferguson does a solid job with the score. Uh, cinematography by Peter Levy. There's actually some really good cinematography. But the gothic style just just doesn't work for Nightmare 5. Um, edited by Brent A. Schoenfield and Chuck Weiss. The editing was was there, but it could have been better. It was it was it was competent, but it wasn't anything spectacular. And it was definitely a lower budget. The film was eight made for eight million, and uh, yeah, didn't have a lot of money to work with for this sequel. Um, I guess both uh, Stephen King and uh, Frank Miller were offered the job of writing and directing this movie, but they turned it down. 
Um, I, I guess I can I can see why. The film was the lowest grossing film in the franchise. It opened at number three at the box office and then disappeared thereafter. It only made $22 million on an $8 million budget. So it made a, a profit, but not very much. And I guess uh, during the production of Nightmare on Elm Street, screenwriter Leslie Boehm, he pitched the idea of a Freddy baby to the studio. This pitch involved the pregnant ex executive to imagine Freddy's claws tearing out of your body. And then his, his pitch wasn't used because that was in bad taste, really. <laughs> um, and the idea of focusing the story around children and birth was hatched by executive producer Sarah Risher, who was a new mother at the time and constantly had her child and it, its well-being in her mind. And the crew decided to build off of this because they felt that teenagers and 20-somethings who were fans of the original film were beginning to reach the age where they were likely thinking about settling down and having families and thus incorporating elements of family and birth into the film would keep the series relevant and special for fans of earlier entries. I think that was a mistake. That was a really big mistake. It was an interesting idea. It was. It was an interesting concept. That's one aspect of the screenplay and the story that I like. I like the aspect behind the film of, of Freddy finding a way to manipulate Alice's baby. And he's finding a way to go use her baby's dreams as an ability to go in and kill more kids. I, I like that because, you know, the, the baby is asleep and is dreaming for a majority of the time while it's in its mother's womb. So that whole concept is unique and it's cool and it's interesting. It puts a new spin on things. It makes it different. And you have Lisa Wilcox, who does a great job with her performance in this film, and she's wondering what's going on and you and the audience are too it's like wait a second i i'm, I'm not asleep how is freddie doing this and 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 uh takes a little bit longer than i would have liked for her to figure it out but uh still i like the concept i like the effort i like the idea it just isn't executed very executed very well it's uh it's and that's too bad. Part of it, maybe it, it would have, maybe it's another thing just like the gothic style and the gothic aesthetic and the gothic, gothic aspects of this film would have worked better in a different movie. Maybe the same thing would apply to this plot. But I think a big thing that would help the film too is it was a lot more fun. It seems like there were some moments where it was kind of having some fun. I said, a lot of the time when I was having fun is in the kill scenes, but everything else seems a little bit too serious for my taste. I mean, you know, a little bit of the graduation scene in the beginning, but a lot of it's just this really serious tone. They're trying, they have the scene where they're trying to show, you know, okay, talking about the drama about the parents of Dan wanting to get, adopt the baby because Alice isn't in the right mind frame. She's, and we have every right to that baby. And no, I'm going to keep my baby. And I'm like, I don't really give a shit. I don't care. I don't I know the pro-choice stuff they're trying to do and the teenage pregnancy angle. And it's just something that's not what we want to, what I want to see in a Nightmare on Elm Street film. It's not what I want to see in a slasher movie. This type of serious approach was a big, big mistake. The first film took itself pretty seriously, but it still knew what type of film it was. It wasn't trying to shove a message down your throat. This film feels like it's trying to shove some message down your throat of t teen pregnancy and, and pro-choice and, and all of this and so forth and so on and adoption and all of this. Cra I don't really care. I come to a Nightmare on Elm Street film to see Freddy... Kill some, kill some teenagers in ingenious, crazy ways and, and say some one-liners. I come to a Nightmare on Elm Street film to have fun. And Nightmare 5 isn't much fun. It's a bus, it's a bus kill. And that's a big problem that the film has that it, I just don't think it ever recovers from. And, um, but yeah, that's just, that's me personally. Uh, the film stars Robert England as Freddy Krueger. Robert, this is one of his... I think one of his worst performances as Freddy, and I don't think it's entirely his fault. It's mostly the screenplay. I mean, he has really a lot of shit. He just didn't have. He doesn't have shit. He doesn't even have shit to work with. He is pretty much nothing. I mean, when you have nothing to work with in terms of really bad lines like "It's a boy" and uh, "Hi, Alice, want to make babies?" 
Yeah, you know, it is really kind of dumb shit. The Super Freddy scene. I mean, I mean, it's really hard. The Bon Appetit thing, you know. It's filet de Bobby, you know. Madam, if I may, Bon Appetit, bitch. And I was just, you know, and the whole, whole scene where he, he has the bottle of champagne, pops it open, bad year, Dan, and then pours it all over himself, and then it's it just like acid, and then like cuts his arm off. It's just kind of stuff. It's just like, what? It just. And Bad Year, Dan, that's the best one you could get. You know, it's true. It was a bad year. 1989 was a bad year for horror films. A bad year for slashers, especially. Bad year for franchises, especially. Because you had Halloween 5, you had Nightmare 5, and you had Friday the 13th Part 8, which all sucked ass. Which were all bad films. Nightmare 5 was the least terrible of the three for me, but it was still bad. I mean, and it just it didn't seem as cool. That's the thing too. Freddy didn't seem as cool on this, and as suave and as as cool. You know, he seemed, you know, like he was in part four and part three. He seemed more corny. I mean, that's a good way to put it. I mean, yeehaw! This boy feels the need for speed. You know, I like that death scene, but I mean, I mean, bad year, Dan, and you know the whole thing, and Freddy, Super Freddy. I mean. Just bad. I'm trying to remember, did they have the Super Freddy line? Wow, I'm surprised they don't have the Super Freddy line on IMDb. That's interesting. <laughs> IMDb is like, nope. I think it was like crazier than a locomotive or some shit. I don't really care whatever the fuck the line was. What was the Super Freddy line? Oh, here it is. There it is. It's faster than a bastard maniac. More powerful than a local madman. It's Super Freddy. I told you comic books were bad for you. It's like, where's the accent coming from? Why is he... It just... I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think... I don't know if it was really Robert's fault, but... Because the writing was fucking pathetic and piss poor for Freddy in this movie, but it had to be somewhat. It had it had to be equal part. I think there was equal parts to blame here, because Robert didn't look like himself in this. He didn't look like he had his heart in this. He didn't look like he was having fun, and he looked like he was tired. And and I don't blame him because at the time he was doing this, this is a year where he did Phantom of the Opera and he also directed 976 Evil. So he directed his first film, he had starred in another Phantom of the Opera, and now he's playing Freddy in the makeup and doing all this and on a four week, in four weeks, you know, I mean, he has to shoot all the scenes in four weeks. I mean, yeah, uh, he was tired. And it definitely did show in this film. He looks a lot more animated. It looks like he's having a lot more fun in Freddy's Dead. Which is a big reason why I like Freddy's Dead. Is because of Robert. Because he's having fun with the role again. And, and, and I have a lot of fun watching the film. And watching Freddy because of that. This just was. It was pathetic. And it was, it was sad. Because Freddy. Because Robert was tired. And he, he was showing his age in this film. And. The lines of dialogue were also really terrible, so they didn't help him either. So, yeah. There's only so much that Robert could do with crap to work with, or not really, pretty much nothing. But, you know, he you could tell that he was not himself. Lisa Wilcox comes back as Alice. She's the best part of the best actor out of the entire film. She's the only reason why I keep watch, kept watching the movie. Um... She also delivers, I think, one of the best acting performances by any actor in, in the franchise. She does a great job here, and it's a real shame that her performance in this and her performance in, in Part 4 overlooked, and it's a real shame that her career never took off, that she was typecasted as a horror actress by, by Hollywood. And that really sucks. That's just, I hate that about Hollywood. That's some of the things I definitely don't like about Hollywood. 
is this bias and this just this complete ignorance and just this this uh, this this stigma they have for horror for for horror actors for horror directors it's just this stigma that they have it just sickens me it's like they never liked horror to begin with and they really didn't the hollywood elite the hollywood producers they want they didn't they didn't want the horror films to be successful that's the last thing they wanted paramount hated the fact that the Friday Thirteenth movies were so were big hits, even Robert Shea felt a little bit ashamed and embarrassed at certain points in his career by the success of Nightmare on Elm Street. So it, it was just one of those things. that's like, why? Why is horror the black sheep of Hollywood? There's some really great films with great directors and and great actors and actresses and 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 composers and editors and cinematographers and this is where we have some of the best visuals in my opinion are from horror films and the only way they get any respect from the academy is for a makeup special effects award it's like you're you're a horror actor well you don't get nominated for shit unless you are in a drama like that's technically not really truly a horror film like silence of the lambs and I think that's bullshit because there's a lot of great actors and actresses that deliver performances that are just Oscar worthy, in my opinion. They're fantastic. And they deliver performances that prove that they should get more of these big dramatic roles later in their career, like Lisa Wilcox in this film, for instance. But it never happens. And that I don't understand why. A talented actor or a talented actress is a talented actor or a talented actress, no matter if they acted in a horror film or not. In fact, horror acting is in some ways harder than some of the dramatic acting that these Oscar Academy Award winning or Academy Award nominated actors and actresses get. I mean, Lisa Wilcox in this film and the film before it in Nightmare 4, she had to act at nothing. She had to act at a wall or a boom mic and do it convincingly because the effects were going to be added in after the film, after the sequences were shot. After her scenes were shot, then the special effects would be added in in post. And she was able to effectively act at pretty much nothing, at air, and do it in a way that's effective and believable. That deserves a lot more praise than it gets. It's not easy to do, and some of these horror actors are just great at it, and and they deserve better. They deserve more respect, and I just wanted to get that little rant out there because they really do. I'm sick of the stigma that's associated with horror. Just because it's a horror film doesn't mean it's automatically full of bad actors who are getting killed off by a, by a crazy maniac with a chainsaw or a machete. Uh, for example, with the Babadook, with Essie Davis amazing performance and I don't think she got nominated for anything maybe something in her native land but the, other than that no recognition whatsoever and that's bullshit because I'm sorry some of these performances are just every bit as good and every bit as Oscar worthy in my opinion as some of these dramatic actors if not even more so I love to see Jennifer Lawrence do a great job acting in a horror film like Essie Davis did in The Babadook or Lisa Wilcox did in Nightmare 4 and 5 and want to see if she would do as good of a job and then of course she wouldn't get recognized by the Academy because the Academy doesn't give a shit about horror which is just because it's a bunch of snooty old men who run the Academy who are just upturn their noses at the idea of horror films horror films are trash they don't deserve to be nominated for Academy Awards, except for maybe in the visual effects or the makeup effects. But other than that, no actors, and no directors, nobody involved with horror films, except for the makeup artists and the special effects guys are going to get awarded with Academy Awards. Which is bullshit. I just wanted to, it's just a, something that was on my head. I just After seeing Lisa Wilcox's performance in this pretty forgettable bad film, and she's the one shining diamond in the pile of shit, so to speak, I just wanted to point that out. I really felt that her she deserved so much better in her career, and she never got that. That's bullshit. 
Beatrice Pop Bo Peppel or Bo Apple plays Amanda Kruger, so we gotta follow that storyline again. Whit Hertford plays Jacob, uh Alice's unborn son. Uh, Kelly Jo Minter plays Yvonne. You might recognize her. She was in uh People Under the Stairs and a few other films. Danny Hassel comes back as Dan. Erica Anderson plays Greta. Nicholas Mele plays uh, Dennis Johnson. Uh, Joe Seeley plays Mark Gray. Valerie Armstrong plays Doris Jordan. And that's really about it. Um, in terms of the cast. When it comes to the plot, I'm just going to go over it real quick. Because I, I really don't want to talk about this film for, for a long, long time. Freddy is supposedly dead. For Seven Events of Part 4. And the movie opens up with one of the strangest openings out of the entire franchise. It's this really eerie, creepy sex scene between Alice and Dan. And it just doesn't fit with the franchise. Right off the bat, you see the, the opening sequence just does not fit with the franchise. You're just like, what the hell is this? And then Alice goes in, takes a shower, and some shit water pours out. And I'm like, great. Yeah, because out of the out of the drain pops out some shit water. Water that's you know, shit colored water. Like it's got shit floating around in it. Shit and piss. And I'm like, no, oh, great. That's a sign of things to come. <laughs> Here comes the shit water. Here comes the shit. <laughs> and the of course she had a cliched scene where Alice gets the, the shower gets full of water, and then she drops out of it naked, and then she ends up in the asylum. Which looks like it's from the 1900s, for some, from early 1900s for some reason. And it does not look like an asylum I've ever seen from the 40s. I've seen pictures from asylums from the 40s. It does not look like an asylum from the 40s. Freddy was supposed to be born the, 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 the event where his mother was raped by a hundred maniacs, you know, was supposed to happen in 1941. And it, that does not look like a 1941 asylum. Uh, this is just what I'm saying. I've seen pictures. I've seen stills. It doesn't look like one to me. Um, so, of course, and then this scene, you also see Robert England in a little cameo without his makeup. So then, Alice pretty much is there, and then she sees Freddy get reborn so to speak. The the maniacs rape his mom again, and then you don't really see the rape, which is good. And then, you know, then Freddy ends up coming back. And he comes back as a Freddy baby. And it's fucking laughable. It's some silly ass stupid shit. One of the low points in the franchise. I mean, a fucking Freddy baby. It just looks, just, no. That's not scary. That's just fucking stupid. And so the Freddy baby finds a glove and finds a sweater and then reforms into Freddy. And then, it's a boy! And then Freddy goes in and and there, there's a... This film doesn't have a very high body count. That's the thing, too, that I don't like. And that's the thing a lot of people didn't like about this movie. For good reason. You're coming in a Nightmare on Elm Street sequel. You want to see Freddy kill some teens. And you only he only kills Dan... Tries to kill Yvonne, but she gets out of it. And he kills uh, the... He kills Greta. So he kills Greta. And he kills the... Uh, kills Mark. So that's only three people. So he kills Joe Seeley, Mark, the comic book geek. And he kills Dan. And he kills Erica Anderson. You know, plays Greta Gibson, and that's it. It's only three kills in in this movie. That's the lowest body count, except for in Freddy vs. Jason. Freddy only kills one person, which is a problem as well. I have with that movie, but I'll get into that soon enough. But it's it's still really low body count for this type of movie, and that hurts the film. The film is not that long, but it feels twice as long as it is. It's it's ninety minutes. But it feels twice as long as it is because of the fact that there is not that many kills in it. And it just has a lot of talking and a lot of a lot of just exposition. And there's even a long scene where Alice just explains to her friends what happened, you know, the origins of Freddy. I'm like, we're in part five now. 
I don't need to hear about the origin of Freddy Krueger again. And then, of course, the whole stuff about the baby. I'm going to keep the baby. And all that and all this other drama that just drags the film out. And it just, it's just such a slow-paced, boring movie. I had a hard time staying awake watching this. I would have rather fallen asleep and dreamed. And if I had a nightmare, whatever, it would probably be about this movie. <laughs> That's probably the nightmare that I would have. I'd have a nightmare about Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, The Dream Child. Um, but yeah, I mean, then they have the whole stuff where people, you know, nobody believes Alice. She figures out that Freddy's using her baby. And doctors think she's crazy and so forth and so on and so on and so on. It doesn't help either that other than Alice and maybe Kelly Jo Mintner's character, Yvonne, there's no other characters you really give a shit about. Greta, I don't care about. She's a stuck-up, snotty, preppy bitch. Um, and she looks a lot like Nicole Arbor, that stuck-up, preppy bitch who made that video where she's fat-shaming, uh, you know, fat people. So it was actually kind of, uh, it was, it was nice, a uh, little bit of vindication to see her get killed off in this movie. She looked almost like a spitting image of Nicole Arbor, so I was like, yeah, kill her. Kill that fucking bitch. Uh, but that's just me. I, I just, I hate, I, that, God, that, 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 that woman. She's not funny, and that was just, yeah, uncalled for video that she did. Um, but yeah, even her death scene sucks, and, and I liked the stuff where Freddy did after she died. Where he turned her into a doll. Into a porcelain doll. And I was like, that's creepier. That's better. And that actually ties into more of her fear. I, I, I guess. I mean, I mean, she's skinny and she doesn't like to eat. So I guess he stuffs her face. But she looks like a fucking garbage pail kid or something. It's not scary. And it, it looks... It, it's it's so much creepier when he turns her into a doll. And it, it's, set, it's set up really well, too. Because you see her in a room... Earlier in the film, and she he has all these porcelain dolls. So it it seems like that's where the kill is going to lead to is he's going to turn her into a doll and then kill her somehow that way. And then they do just this lame dinner scene, which is awkward and isn't funny and full of over the top acting, and it's just bad all the way around. One of the worst kills in the franchise. And and, and you missed out. It wasn't even that ingenious. It wasn't even that inventive that's the thing it was lazy it was a lazy kill for a franchise that i thought prided itself in its ingenuity and they just have freddy just oh bon appetit bitch and then just starts shoving food in her mouth she's got ch giant chipmunk cheeks now and she chokes and that's it not much of anything i like the dan kill that's the one where he turns him into like uh, looks like a, a fucked up Ghost Rider. Really, I, I like that look too. The mega effects are good. I like the cool thing where the 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 motorbike comes to life and put your pedal on the metal, Dan. You know, speed kills. And uh, I didn't really like the stuff leading up to it with the whole thing. Like you shouldn't drink, dream, and drive, Dan. Bad year. You know, it's just, and that was just weird. Like he pours. Champagne on him, champagne on himself is like acid. Then he cuts his own arm off and sticks it on the ceiling of the truck. It's not scary. It's just random, and it doesn't make any sense why Freddy would do that. But um, excuse me. But anyway, so you have that kill scene, which I like, and I really love the look of the of Dan once he's got his skull stripped and. He's, you know, molded, melded. He ends up being turned into the bike, pretty much. I, I like that. Uh, see, when he's a living bike, I, I like that. It's a really cool idea, and it's really well done. It's a great makeup effect. Uh, then you have the Greta scene, which is a serious letdown in comparison to that. Then you have the scene where Mark kills the Phantom Prowler. And then I like the idea of the comic book stuff. And I guess originally all his artwork is supposed to come to life, but they had to cut it due to budget constraints. But I like the idea behind it. 
the idea of Freddy going into the comic book world and bringing in this comic book geek into the comic book world and killing him there. And I like the black and white stuff in the beginning and the production design at in the beginning of this sequence. And then it just goes downhill as soon as Freddy shows up on a skateboard. And you're like, oh god, this is just bad. And then it goes even further downhill when Mark becomes a Phantom Prowler, overacts his ass off, thinks he's a tough guy, shoots Freddy. Of course, he gets back up, and then he's like, Super Freddy! And then I'm like, this is the stupidest Super Shredder. And just as lame. And then Super Freddy kills Dan, and it was an interesting looking scene, but it wasn't that scary, and it wasn't that memorable. And that's it. I mean, Kevin Joe Minter tries to kill her in a really shitty way where she jumps off a diving board and it turns into some clusterfuck or whatever. I don't know. Like she falls in hell or some shit. Or the boiler room. or I don't care. It's just a really terrible looking uh, sequence. I think that is definitely one of the worst attempted dream kills in the franchise. I think it, it literally looks like shit to me. Um... And then Alice, you know, has the stuff with her kid, and she sees Jacob, and then realizes, oh, it's her unborn kid, and Freddy's trying to corrupt her, and then she has to stop Freddy, and then there's some cool, there's a cool scene where she faces off with Freddy and shoves a pipe in his mouth. I'm like, yeah, it's more of the Alice I know and love from part four, but no, really what happens is really lame shit at the end. Freddy gets killed by his son. Who decides, you know, let's, I, I want to teach me more, Kruger. I'm just like, school's out, Kruger. And then, this is so stupid. Then he uses his power that Freddy gave him to kill Freddy. And then, in a really shitty version of the death scene from, the, from part four, stuff starts ripping out of his body. And it's like, it's like uh, the souls of the, 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 the teens that he killed in this movie. And they're like, whoa! Why? You know, they have these like this garbage peel kids' faces, and it just it just looks terrible. And then they, they pop out of him, you know, trying to be like it just doesn't work. And then they rip the Freddy baby out of his stomach. And then of course Amanda Kruger comes in and grabs the baby, and then brings it back into herself, into her womb. And then she tries to go. She ends up leaving, and then all these doors slam and break. Which is a good shot, which is crazy how that was done. They used all these sugar glass, and it broke, and it left all this just complete layer of melted sugar glass on the on the floor. And like you step on it, and your shoes just got covered in sugar glass because it was over a hundred degrees in the place that they were shooting this effect sequence. And uh, then then they they went to lunch, and they realized they had to do it again. And then it was just the layer was even 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 taller, you know, this just melted sugar glass, which there actually sounds like the behind the scenes of this movie are more interesting and more engaging than the movie itself. Oh, and of course, in this dream sequence near the end, too, where Alice is, decides she ends up going into the dream world, um, and she draws, saying, you know, Freddy, you know, she goes into Freddy's uh, world, you know, goes into the church, you know, which you saw in part four, and you have the MC Escher style stuff where the staircase is upside down and stuff like that. It's a good shot. It just doesn't really fit with Nightmare on Elm Street. And then Freddy's got this weird thing where his arm got messed up. And then he, because I guess, I think Alice fucked him up. And then like he cut, ties it back on and it just looks stupid. And it's just, just a bad, bad, bad film. And uh, yeah, it ends with... Freddy's baby getting put back in his mom's womb, and then door slam, and then Alice gets out of the dream, and she has her. Then you flash forward, and she has her baby, and she ends up, uh, you know, taking care of it with her dad, and and uh, she meets with her father and Yvonne in the park, and then all appears back to you know, all appears to be normal, but then the camera pans to a group of shit kids doing singing the one two. You know, Freddy song. The one, two, Freddy's coming for... Yeah, that type of, you know, type of ending I've seen a, done a million times before in the franchise. So, yeah, that's it. And then you have, like, a shitty rap song at the end. So that doesn't help either. And then, and then the big, you know, hit rap song they had for this was a really, real, a real stinker by Houdini. Where they were like, anyway, I gotta swing it 
Anyway, I gotta swing it. Anyway, I gotta swing it. Anyway. Which really, when it comes to this movie, it should be anyway. I gotta swig it anyway. I gotta swig it anyway. I gotta swig it. It's pretty much, you know, in order to sit through this shit and not fall asleep, I may be having to get, I may have to get drunk tonight. <laughs> really. That's pretty much the only way that that's gonna happen. Yeah, that's Freddy's, that's, uh, I was going to say Freddy's Dead, but I actually like Freddy's Dead, so I'm sorry. I'm just trying to, I'm already thinking of a movie I'd rather talk about than Nightmare 5. That's Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5. The Dream Child. If you like the film, be my guest. I'm just not one of them. And I really don't know what to say about the movie, because I was rated out of 5 stars. Uh, I'd probably say I would rate it. Uh, I would rate it. I'm actually gonna give it I'm actually gonna give it two. Mainly one one star just for out for Alice for Lisa Wilcox's performance and she does a great job with it. And the other is a combination of things. It's uh it's uh the score. I like Jay Ferguson's score, I like the cinematography, even though it doesn't ever necessarily mesh with the film all the time. I still like it. And I, I like some of the production design and I like uh one of the kills, I do like the Dan Dan's kill, and I, I like uh, I like uh, you know I like the Kelly Joe Minter's character for the most part, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of and uh, the visual effects. I like the visual effects and and I thought especially the stuff of the inside of the womb and that that was actually really well done. Um, but other than that. That's it, really, because it's only three kills in, out of the entire in the entire film. It's very slow paced. It's boring. It's insufferably dull and boring for the most part. And that's its that's its ultimate failing. That's its ultimate flaw. It's boring. It's a really boring Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It's a really boring film. It's it's a big step down from Part Four, which was an immensely entertaining movie. It was a really fun flick to watch, and this is just painful to sit through for the most part um the only thing keeping it together and the only thing keeping you interested is alice and you want to make sure she makes it out alive and she does and i like that about the film too is that alice is is actually you know she survived she's she's uh her character makes it she doesn't die in the franchise it's not like ellie cornell on halloween five you know that's why i, I i'm more partial to this movie over halloween five uh, both movies are not very good, but Halloween 5 is worse to me than Nightmare 5. Um, that's a whole other story, but yeah, two stars. It's a poor movie. It's not a very good film. It's not executed very as well as it could be, and it's it's got elements of it that are just don't work. Um, but I do, like I said before multiple times, I do admire and I do respect the effort and I'm glad at least they tried. At least Stephen Hopkins and company, they tried to do something different with Nightmare on Elm Street. And they tried to do something with it that wasn't the same old, same old. But it just didn't work out. And uh, it's too bad, but hey, shit happens. And, and this movie is, for the most part, pretty much shit. But anyway, I really don't want to say, except thank you for watching my review and rant. But not really much of a rant. I mean, I don't like the film, but I'm not really like chomping at the bit at it. Uh, but anyway, thank you for watching, and I will see you guys later. See ya.